Welcome everyone to the uh, first of NGA summer seminars for uh, 2022. I must say we did debate whether to go back to a conference in person this June because pre-COVID we did always have a summer conference in June and I must say given that we've chosen the week of the train strikes I'm really very pleased that you are joining us virtually. That saved us a lot of last minute um, uh, heartaches. Uh, as always, um, I have a team here at NGA who are helping us with this event. Uh, my name is Emma Knights. I'm the chief executive. Um, and I may well be talking to Fiona, who is moving our slides along. So Fiona, can you start uh, with the next slide? please. Um, this is just to highlight the other seminars for the rest of the week and a few more events that we have this term. Uh, it's usually at the end of the uh, PowerPoint, but I know that uh, I will take this discussion right up to the dot of, of six o'clock. So there you are a reminder of what else is, is coming this week. Can you move me on, please? Uh, so this is one of what we hope will be a very uh, interactive discussion. We're really pleased to have some uh, expert presenters, but then that will leave half of the event uh, very much um, for a question and answer a conversation. Um, and I was just saying to our presenters, I, we have never had an event where MGA members haven't had lots of things to ask. So please do begin to put your comments um, in, in the chat. The presentation um, will be uh, emailed to you um, later in the week alongside any resources that we have mentioned. Um, and But a big difference um, is that uh, quite often we don't share the recordings, um, but actually to the summer seminar recordings we do. In fact, last year's and the annual seminars are, are available on the website now for you to have a look back at. So these will be um, shared with the rest of our membership. Um, and on the bottom of that slide, you can see that we are using um, hashtag NGA comp. So those of you that tweet, I know a large number of you do, please, uh, please do join in there as well. Can you move me on, please, Fiona? Uh, so we like to start all our events uh, with just a quick question of who we've got in the room. And we think that's quite uh, good for all of you to see. So there we are, our two initial um, questions. If you could um, uh, choose those that apply to you. Um, and you can answer more than one because we know some of you govern um, in more than one place and indeed some of you govern in one place and lead in another. So Molly, when there are enough answers, can you share those with us, please? Many of you are saying it's sunny. It's very good of you to join us when the sun. Um, oh, this is this is really interesting to see in some of our events. Um, we have chairs as the biggest group. So it's great to see a lot of you who have other roles um, on the governing board. And as we're used to now, a, a, a good smattering of governance professionals as well. Can you just, Molly, um, move that? Uh, slide down so we can see we've got which type of organization do you govern at 43% maintain schools oh is it me that needs to turn it down she says foolishly yes it is um, uh, Matt um, trust wide 32% at school level within a mat 16% single academy trust 17% and others uh, 13 so that's a really good um, really really good um, spread of people so thank you so much um, uh, for joining us now could you move me on please Oh yes, we're, we're so pleased with this project to have had some pictures of real live schools with real live children and teachers um, uh, in them. So just, just for to get us going on today's uh, subject of greener governance. Um, and on to the next, please. 
So I uh, mentioned uh, we have three uh, panelists who will be um, speaking uh, after I've set a little bit of context. Really pleased to have Jonathan Dewsbury from the Department of Education. Um, oh, I, I do like your job title, Senior Responsible Owner for Sustainability and Climate Change. So Jonathan's leading the work there at the Department for Education and um, what a, a, a great piece of work has been going on um, uh, there. Then we have um, Professor Andrew Charlton Perez, who in fact, we've even squashed in uh, some of your credentials, Andrew, so that it fitted on one uh, line because you've got many fingers in, in, in many pies and a longer job title. If I remember, you're not just a professor of meteorology, but definitely had mathematics in there as, um, in there as well. Um, you do govern, but you're going to talk to us about the project um, at the University of Reading. And then Alex Green, who is Programme Manager of Ashton Climate Change Charity, who um, run the, well, I, I was about to say the very well-known um, uh, Let's Go Zero uh, project. I hope many of you will already have signed up, but Alex will be telling you more later on. And we'll make sure we have a good time um, for for discussion. But I just thought I'd um, uh, mention now just how good it's been to learn from so many people um, across not the, the school sector quite so much um, today, but, but the green sector. There has been so much sharing of expertise from people who are working in sustainability, producing resources um, for uh, schools um, and trusts. It's, it's been um, it, yeah, incredibly collaborative and people have been very generous um, with their time and, and expertise expertise. And I realize I haven't done what I always try and do at the beginning of any session, which is to thank you the, for the audience, for what you do, for your schools, for your pupils, for your um, communities. Um, actually, it's been great to have the engagement from our governors and trustees as well. So if you can move me on. Um, just setting the context, I have got lots of lovely pretty slides which I can't speak to because we'll never get onto the uh, uh, proper panel. So we will be whizzing through these at quite, quite a rate, but it was really to emphasize just how much there is now um, for schools and trusts and particularly what NGAs tried to do, really make sure uh, things that are very particular for um, governing boards um, them, themselves. Um, so there is um, uh, quite a few uh, resources that I am going to, to name check. Um, but if you can move me on to the next, um, uh, Fiona, this was where we started. I know some of you have been with us in a way we went public um, in November. There was November, was it October now? She says um, uh, COP, the end um, uh, during, during COP26. Um, hanging our um, renewed guidance on environmental sustainability uh, with a pledge, a plug for greener governance in which we were asking you to sort of put this um, environmental sustainability onto the agenda of your governing board and um, ensure that uh, a climate action plan was being developed. Some of you may remember in our very first iteration, we called it an action plan, but we were trying to keep up with the DFE there. So once the department strategy was published, we slipped that word in so that we're all using the same, uh, the same language. Can you move me on, please? Um, and one of the things that we've done, uh, I just wanted to uh, give a bit of a name check for the um, National Association for Environmental Education, who've been going on, as you can see from their logo, since 1971, working in this field. And we um, adopted from them, with their blessing, their four C's model um, uh, for considering environmental sustainability. So culture, campus, curriculum, community and the resources that we've produced are very much based on that. We did consider when the department strategy very much highlighting green careers, which is a really great thing to be doing, whether we ought to have a fifth C, but actually we decided that the four C's have gained so much traction that for now we're, we're, sticking, we're sticking with them. Can you move me on please, Fiona? 
So this should be a ta-da moment because many of you will know we do an annual governance survey um, and we don't formally publish the reports until um, September. However, we have begun the analysis. So this is um, a figure that uh, Megan Tate has given me. And actually I should really say um, that uh, Megan from our policy and research team has absolutely been instrumental in this project. She's been working alongside me from the uh, beginning Beginning, and many of you will have been dealing with Megan um, during the development of resources. Um, so yes, thank, thank you, Megan, for those. So here we go. This was a question we asked in our annual survey in 2020, and we asked again in 2022. Has your school or trust acted on environmental sustainability? And look, the numbers have actually gone slightly down from 44% to 41%. But so I did think of taking out the 2020 figures, uh, but then thought, hey, come on, NGA's not that sort of organization. We are very transparent. But actually, I think it, it, it gives me a chance to say when we saw those in 2020, we weren't entirely convinced that they were right because we began having conversations with some of you in order to develop this, this project. And we were finding it at that point quite difficult to find schools or trusts who'd sort of moved off first base. So actually, I think the 2022 um, figures are much more likely to represent real life because people now know what's a little bit more about what's um, what's involved. So I'm not I'm not gnashing my teeth about those results. They they seem very reasonable to me given just how much else um, is is happening at the moment. So could you move on, Fee, please? And and again, uh, we asked people which um, areas you'd been um, working on. So the top one that came up uh, was 37% have been working on campus issues, <clears throat> about a quarter on curriculum. And I'm not being very careful with my language here. Clearly, it won't be the governing board themselves developing curriculum. It will be the school and, and, and trust um, doing that. 22% on culture and then 17% on, on things that they were labeling um, community. Particularly things that people have done was thinking about outdoor learning. And obviously some of this has gone on for really quite a long time. This didn't just start um, with the latest uh, climate crisis figures um taught um uh, more um in than is required in the national um curriculum and lastly um recycling was was mentioned uh, quite a lot again something that we know has been going on for for quite a long time so if we can move on please so last week um we published our um new version of our guidance the the lovely green the lovely green one so what we've done is expanded on our november um uh, guidance which we updated um uh, uh started uh, to to update so this is this is the new um uh, guidance i'm sure somebody is going to put the um link in the chat for you some of you may have already seen it i hope it's useful we built um we built on it in light of what you told us in the four seminars that we held um in the spring term and you were asking for specifics for tips for resources for example so we hope um that this begins to um answer uh, many of those queries without making it too long if you can move me on, please. That's a plug for our guidance on um, being strategic, because clearly one of the pushes we want boards to do is to be saying, actually, this is something that ought to feature in our schools or trusts uh, strategy. Um, and in fact, that's going to be updated next, um, next term as well, although the uh, process and philosophy won't change. And on to the next, please. The guidance includes uh, quite a bit about what is the board role compared with what is the role of leaders and staff um, within a school or um, trust, because one can argue that actually 
maybe as with all things in school life, the bulk of the work is going to be done by your school leaders and your and school staff, both in terms of um, uh, business leadership, but also obviously in it, um, leading uh, education work, leading on, on the curriculum. And your job uh, as a board is to try and ensure that there is resources available to do this work. That's both people, um, but also funding where funding is, um, is required. Uh, stakeholders are a big part of this um, work for boards. And I think one of the other really positive things that we've seen is how many people in the wider community community are really passionate about this topic and actually want to give their time to schools or trusts. So that not might not be volunteering on the board, but getting involved in other green, um, green projects. So if you could move me on, please. And I'm not going to talk about um, each of those, um, but really just to flash them before your eyes, they're attached to our Greener Governor page, um, a governance page as well. But it looks at some of the different things that we've covered in the magazine. Obviously, the DFE strategy, both when it was draft and now that it's um, uh, finalised. Climate in the classroom, Andrew's going to be um, talking, talking about that. The article about climate for change covers a number of about 10 case studies, people that put themselves um, forward on the work that they've been, um, been doing. And our la last one that came out just at the end of last week, or at least it arrived on my doorstep at the end of last week, um, which has some uh, resources um, from other organisations that I mentioned very briefly before. So if you can move on. So and then if you flick through the next three as well, Fiona, because these are really just to show that no matter what type of school you are, there are examples um, of whether you're a multi academy trust, a primary, a secondary um, schools and trusts have come forward to say this is how we've applied it in our in our setting. Um, I usually invent an excuse at members' um, events to just mention our e-learning, but how appropriate is it um, to this project? Um, when we started um, Learning Link five years ago now, we chose green for a reason. Uh, e-learning is an environmental option. We're not saying you should never do face-to-face -face learning, uh, but actually e-learning has a really important role to play. So that's a, a reminder of, um, of, of that, which perhaps we haven't made enough of uh, during, during this project. And if you can move me on, Fiona, please. So lastly, at least I think this is, if I remember correctly, the last slide from me. It's a plug for our campaign page, the Greener Governor page that Megan keeps up up to date as well as the guidance there's a whole bunch of other resources there um, and one I wanted to um, plug uh, today is the fact that School IP have volunteered um, to produce a free this is what I meant about people really engaging with this agenda and wanting to do stuff so they have produced a free um, audit for boards and um, leaders which is based on the four C's and our 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 guidance as a way of, um, we hope, a tool that is helpful to, to you both in terms of planning but also um, monitoring. So do have a, a look at that if you think that would be uh, of use. So there, I told you I was going to rattle through that at high speed. I feel as though I need to take a few breaths now. So before I introduce the first of our panel, I just thought it'd be interesting to ask that question again, Molly, if you could put up um, the um, slide that should say um, environmental sustainability. I just wondered whether the people that have come this afternoon are people that are already working um, in, in this field. I hope it's a cross section, some of you who may not have started um, at all, or do you um, have the same profile as our membership more widely? Molly, can you tell us what the answer is? 
Yes, 55%. Also, oh, you're a little bit more um, ahead of the game than our general membership, but I'm also really pleased to see that some of you here, this is the first time that you have been um, involved in these discussions. Thank you very much. So may I now um, introduce um, Jonathan Dewsbury, um, uh, properly, who is both deputy director and, as I mentioned, senior responsible owner for sustainability and climate change. And he and his team have been absolutely um, crucial in terms of the DFE coming up with their strategy for sustainability. So without any more ado, the floor is now yours, Jonathan. Thank you, Emma. I just check you can hear me OK. You can. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I just want to start by thanking Emma and the team for working with us in producing the strategy. It was great to have the conversations through the last nine months as we moved to publishing the strategy in April, um, as we had across lots of places in the sector. But um, thank you for for the NGA uh, for having me and for, for for being involved with the development of the strategy. It's been great. I wanted to uh, quickly summarise the strategy and then talk about the opportunity. Um, and then where governors will play a crucial role, we think, in delivering this opportunity. Um, so on the, I can't remember the date now, but it's probably the 21st of April, I think, we published our strategy at the Natural History Museum. And um, the Secretary of State launched it at the Natural History Museum because we fundamentally believe in the department that the role that nature has in uh, inspiring the whole of the UK in to delivering a significant amount of behavioural change and change to deliver on what is outlined in our strategy and in the government's wider net zero strategy and uh, the 25 year environmental plan. We really much believe that the education is, the, is going to be the key that unlocks those two other strategies. So the, the government's net zero strategy and the, um, the 25 year environmental plan. So we've set a vision for the education sector to be a world leader, the UK education sector to be a world leader in sustainability and climate change by 2030. And we know it's a bold ambition and we know we're not there anywhere near that yet. I was at Wilton Park conference last week with some leaders from countries all around the world, but mainly from Africa and listening to, to the effects of climate change on their education systems um, and learning about what they are doing and how they're doing it. And we have so much to learn from, from those countries that are facing the impacts immediately and how we can learn from them and, and how we can contribute to helping them solve some of the problems they face. When it was quite quite bleak to hear some of the things going on in Bangladesh or in um, uh, Malawi um, in terms of the impact of climate on, on just keeping their, their school buildings open. And then when I look in the context of our own country, and we know that there are 10,000 schools at risk of significant flood, because, and that will go up to 14,000 if we keep temperatures to two degrees. So there is uh, a massive amount of things to do, but we, we are fundamentally trying to pitch the, the role of truth and hope in this and that see how what changes we can make and to, to, to drive through. So we've set out our strategy, which has that vision and it has four strategic aims. The first one around delivering excellence and skills and knowledge for a changing world. We know that the young people moving through education now will need different sets of skills and different knowledge to be able to, to uh, take up those green jobs and, and, and function the green economy in the future. We want to make, to make sure that our education system is climate resilient. Um, and that's resilient to the effects of flood, resilient to the effects of overheating. I think I saw in the messages people saying how hot it is in different places. I mean, last week's been, where I've been anyway, has been bizarre in temperature. And you'll notice the frequency of um, events like that and uh, have been significantly increasing over the last couple of years. We want to obviously achieve net zero to mitigate any further changes in climate. And we also want to create a better environment for, for, for the future generations. We know the UK has the worst biodiversity in Europe, but we also know that the education state is a, a humongous asset. We have a massive opportunity to be able to improve the biodiversity and access nature through the education estate. And we plan to do this via, via five action areas. So one, looking at climate education, two, looking at green skills and careers, three, looking at the education estate and digital infrastructure, four, about the supply chains and operations and how we how we govern and, 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 and organise schools, and then five, about how we take our seat at the international stage. So how do we push things we're doing well and how do we learn from others across the international stage and make sure that we really keep the momentum up into COP27. So Emma said at the start, 
So one of the reasons I was at this conference last week was to try and start building momentum into COP27 for climate education, because at COP26, we were very pleased to work with the Italian government, UNESCO, and uh, a number of youth organizations, Mock COP and Teach the Future and uh, uh, Youth for Climate, um, to put on the first ever event between education ministers and climate ministers and, and got over got around 30 pledges on what they do on climate education. There were notable countries that weren't that weren't didn't make a pledge about climate education, some big, big economies that didn't make a pledge. And so we want to, to push that moving forward at COP27, demonstrate what progress we've made in the UK and, and to hear about what progress other countries have made and, and push those pledges further. And so our strategy is out there and hopefully some of you have digested it, but I just want to spend a couple of moments talking about the opportunity. There are, there are 16 million people, young people in education, 2.4 million in, in, in adult education. The size of the education state in combination with that number of people, the education state, I think schools alone is, is twice the size of Birmingham. Um, the procurement pipeline in construction in, in the school system and then in supplies is in excess of 20 billion pounds. The potential is absolutely huge, but we also know that we contribute a lot to those emissions. 36% of public sector emissions come from the education estate. So from universities, schools, colleges, I think 25% directly from schools. Um, the next biggest contributor is the NHS. And I think in previous crises, education has always been thought as, as an afterthought. It's always what role does the Department for Education play? We're always on, on, the, on the sidelines. But in sustainability and climate change, we are one of the biggest, A, contributors, but secondly, one of the biggest solutions to helping solving the climate change problem. And um, well, that's why we're going launching some really what we think quite bold initiatives around, for example, the National Education Nature Park, which is the concept of if we bring all the land from every school, college, nursery and university together into a virtual nature park, we can demonstrate what the biodiversity and the resilience of that education state is now and what the emissions of that state are now and demonstrate how if we empower both teachers, governors, young people, the community, to rewild, to improve resilience, to improve community engagement with that education state, how we can significantly improve those things, how we can improve the resilience to flood, how we can improve shading so it's not as hot, how we can improve air quality around those sites. Um, and so we, we've we've launched a tender for that, that's out for tender at the moment, and we hope to, to go live with the Nature Park and then the Associated Climate Leaders Award in, in November time. But in the strategy, we've got lots of different initiatives lots of different things there are some specific things i think governors and uh the nga are interested in and that we would love your help with um and i want to draw your attention to so one as emma's mentioned at the start is the the climate action plan and we've set the expectation that we'd want all settings or education settings to have a climate action plan in place by 2025 and i think it's typical for the dfe to sort of then send out some guidance say this is how you should do it but you'll see in the nga uh, guidance that was published in June uh, that the Emma referenced at the start, it talks about a whole systems or a whole schools approach. And we very much want to follow that. We want to go on that journey as a department with, with our education settings. Um, none of us quite know exactly the answers in these climate action plans, what we need to do, but we need to start on that journey together and I guess work within pillars. So we're thinking about pillars at the moment, about climate education, how we think about decarbonisation, how we think about restoring nature, how we provide more resilience, um, and how we think about how we procure better. And they all fit very neatly into the four, four C's that um, is pushed by the NGA uh, guidance, to either culture, the campus, the curriculum and the community. So we think about how they all they roll in. And we very much see those climate action plays, plans being pulled together as in the school community. So the pupil will be involved in preparing that climate action plan alongside the parent or the carer, alongside the governor, and alongside the teacher. We very much see that the community can be able to deliver it. And we see our job in the DfE in providing the tools and the support alongside that to facilitate how those climate action plans are put in place in the right way for the individual setting. Because um, we, we recognize that this is gonna be a large psychological change for some organizations. I think the stats are quite interesting, aren't they? 44% down to 41 I, on people taking action. I wondered if that, when I saw those numbers, was that if that was because people actually now recognize what action they have to take and feel a little bit more cautious about the action they have to take now rather than less, less thinking less about it. So we need to go on this journey as a community and, and some of the tools I say we, we, that we're gonna put in place uh, to help do that, but we are working with the likes of um, Alex at Ashton and the likes of Andrew um, with his, one of his other hats, not his Reading University hat or his uh, 
uh, governor hat, but his National Climate Education Action Group hat. You must have a very big hat stand, Andrew. Um, we uh, we're going to put we we make sure we provide uh, training for one person in every setting, and and each setting may choose that to be a different person. You may choose that to be a, a school leader. You may choose that to be a governor. You may chair that to be the the chair of governors. But that will be you know, dictated by the school. But the department is is going to provide the the training for for one person in every setting to help uh, improve the climate literacy in the education system to then move towards climate action plans. We're going to think about updating our our good estates management guidance. We're going to review our procurement frameworks to make sure it's easier to select eco-friendly companies. Um, and we want to, to, to shift towards procurement that all, to pure procurement to companies that can commit to achieving net zero. Uh, so I think I, I just would conclude by saying we are trying to take a different approach on how we set um, vision i suppose and and leadership for this area i think typically the department of education might set out some 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 guidance about this is what you should do a b c d and i don't think we're in that position with with trying to solve the problem of climate change we we have come from behind in terms of like emma and the people at nga have been well ahead of us in terms of thinking about changing and green greening governance and same thing climate change and we are catching up in some places and we're adding other places so we're trying to learn and go on that journey with with all of everybody in our sectors and we want to continue to gauge with with communities like this, like the NGA uh, and and governors, to think about what is the best way of us putting in place climate action plans, um, meeting those pillars around climate education, decarbonisation, the ones we went through earlier. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to say for now, Emma. But I'm really looking forward to answering questions um, and and talking through with everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And um, moving now um, to uh, Andrew of the of the many um, hats. Andrew, I will I will leave it to you to decide which of those you're going to um, prioritise um, uh, today and introduce um, to to the audience. So over to you. Oh, and I think you might be on mute, which I just did as, as well. How about now? Is that any better? Yep, I can now. I can now um, uh, hear you. So, and so can Fiona, who will be moving okay. your slides on. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Apologies. Um, yeah, Fiona, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, so yes, um, I, I do have many hats, but in many ways, this is a kind of interesting. Um, example of, of a couple of those hats colliding uh, to, to torture the metaphor even further so yeah i'm a i'm a professor of metrology i work at the university of reading um leading three departments of which one is a is a world leading um climate science institution in itself um but i also in my in my evenings i'm a, a chair of governors at a local primary school radstock primary school um so i wanted to talk a bit about some of the work we've been doing um, at the University of Reading and, and with, a, with an organisation that we're leading called the, the National um, Climate Education Action Plan Group. Um, so next slide, please. So um, Emma has already introduced the, the Greener Governance Framework um, and as an NGA member, I'm really, really delighted to see this. Um, I, I'm going to focus very much here on the kind of curriculum aspect, um, but, but I think absolutely, as, as John has also described, um, there is so much interesting work to do here, which which fits across these these different four C's, and um, they, they shouldn't be viewed in isolation. So there is a lot of great work on curriculum, which can benefit from work on your on your school or college campus, uh, fr from work with your community. And so I I want to be really clear at, at, at the start that I I'm just focusing here because this is my kind of. Um, area of expertise, I suppose, but I really hope we'll, we'll talk about them uh, holistically later. So next slide, please. So yes, so our our route in here was really thinking about uh, on the on this area of curriculum. So this area of, of climate education, um, there was so much good work um, already going on, and I'm sure many of your schools already engaged in some of that work, thinking about how to weave elements of climate and sustainability education into, into curricula at whatever level uh, your organization works at. 
but we felt that there was a real need for kind of bringing together a number of organizations so um both the dfe uh, let's go zero and alex and, and the nga and emma and many other organizations that, that we had connections with and so we did that in september 2021 um and, and came up with um, a, a very short list of actions that we felt were critical for delivering better better climate education um and and you know we're really pleased to to see that that many of those align very well with um with with the dfe strategy um and so if you want to find out a bit more about that um you can you can click on that link uh there but what i wanted to just talk about today is to just talk about a few of those actions and think about how they're relevant to, to governors and i'm really using my own frame of reference here as someone who is a governor um, but if we move on to the to the next slide please I think I'm, you know, what's really great about this event today is that there's a lot of opportunity to talk. And so when I was thinking about the different actions and how they relate to, to governance, uh, I was thinking that actually I probably wanted to ask lots of questions of all of you. And so um, I hope that that in the discussion today we'll have the opportunity to kind of get into some of that uh, detail and think about how some of these things will, will work in practice. So just go, to go through four of those actions, which I think are really relevant here. So I think the first one is that there is a real pressing continuous professional development needs here for staff. Um, that comes across when you look at surveys that, uh, for example, Teach the Future or other organizations have done um, talking to teachers. Uh, and there's, there's a huge willingness here, I think, from staff at all levels in, in schools to, to work on, on climate and sustainability, but a real concern that uh, they have the skills to, to do so. And so, I think it's really important as governors that we we continue to ask questions about how that continuum professional development is going to be delivered. There are many options out there. The, the Carbon Literacy Organization is, is a great uh, one who can, who can help with that. STEM Learning have some great um, professional development uh, work for teachers and many other organizations do as well. And so one thing we're doing in our group is trying to bring some of that together to, to kind of give a, a menu of options for, for schools to think about. I think absolutely vital, the third action on our list is about encouragement and empowerment. And I think the leadership of governors here is, is really vital. How do we facilitate our schools or trusts in developing climate action plans? Um, what support do we need? You know, there's a different continuing professional development need for us as governors in the same way that, that we have, um, have needs in terms of our, our other responsibilities in, in school and our other leadership tasks. But, but we need some help with that as well. So what is it that we need? Um, how, how are we going to get that um, and access it? I think action four, um, and I'm sure Alex will, will talk about this as well, is that um, having, having someone in school who's leading on this area feels really critical to us because of its joined up nature, because it needs to join across those four Cs. Because when we're thinking particularly about the curriculum, what we're not necessarily thinking about here always is a focus in science or geography or maths. Um, it's, it's how some of that that information is is woven through the, the things that we that we teach our young people. Um, so how do we how do we make that role um, really important in school? How do we, how do we incentivize it? Um, what do we need to to make that sustainability uh, lead really kind of tangible and something that that teachers and other school staff really aspire to? And then I think that the the final action that I want to highlight here is about working with professionals. So one one of the things that um, I think is, is perhaps not so commonly known is that the, the UK is really a leading climate research action um, country. It has, has many um, people working in this area. Um, and there actually is a huge desire amongst that, that community, amongst the people I know, to do some of this work because they, there is a wide understanding of the importance of, of education in, in helping us to, to deliver against our climate targets adapt to the climate change which is already coming coming and so we want to know kind of how how we can join those two things together and i'll talk in a second about one initiative that, that we're working on that will help to do that um, so next slide please um, so yeah so um, one way that we're trying to do this and it's by no means the only way um, is is a new climate ambassador scheme so we launched this uh, at the same time of the launch of the um, of the DFE strategy. 
And the idea really there is to unlock this expertise. So we have around 25 or so uh, institutions nationwide who are, who are signed up to this scheme, including the Met Office, many universities, national centers for earth observation and atmospheric science. And already in just two months, we have 66 ambassadors signed up, uh, people who, who want to give their time, want to give their expertise to, to schools and colleges. Um, and so we, I would really encourage you to have a look at that scheme, um, put in a request for an ambassador. Um, what we're imagining here is that those ambassadors do, do a whole range of things that are associated with developing climate action plans and improve, improving climate education in schools and colleges. So that's not just coming and talking to teachers or delivering CPD, which is something they could do, but it may also be coming in and briefing governors. It may also be coming and talking to, to large trusts and, and, and thinking about how this expertise can, can help you to develop your own action plans. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so just to go slightly off topic, I, one, of the, one of the questions that Emma suggested might be, it might be an interesting one for us to address later on in the discussion, um, is kind of this idea of how we engage governors on boards where there's perhaps a reluctance to think about this as, a, as an important topic. I know as a, as a governor, there are huge numbers of, of different competing priorities which, which happen in school, which, which we have to deal with. Um, the most recent example, of course, being COVID. Um, and so I thought it would be useful just to kind of, this is almost a bit backwards, but to kind of think about the context here and why this is important for our young people. Um, so, so what I really wanted to highlight here, this is, this is a figure from the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, and it shows the different pr uh, projections of global temperature um, from 19, well, the, the observations from 1950 to 2015, and then the latest kind of global projections under different scenarios, so different ways in which the, the world economy and society might develop. And just to highlight that we're in the period where these te temperatures are changing a lot. So our children that are in education now, um, you know, our reception children will be 18 at the point here in, in, in 2035, where, where the temperatures probably will be close to, to 1.5 degrees uh, above pre-industrial. By 2050, you know, the children who are already with us, that they'll be, they'll be in, in middle age, they'll be, you know, having families and, and careers of their own. So this is something that is already happening. It's something we need to prepare our young people for. And then just on the, on the final slide, please. Um, and I think there's a really important point to be made here about the kind of global and local effects of, of climate change and, and biodiversity change, um, because they will affect how these young people live. So um, many of you will have seen the, the top figure there, known as the, the burning embers figure. Um, so that's from, a, from another IPCC report, which looks at the impact, uh, the, the differences in the impact on various uh, measures between 1.5 degrees of global warming and two degrees of global warming. And the darker the red color there, the, the stronger the impacts. And so you can see all the different areas there which might be affected by our changing climate. Uh, and you can see that where we, where we go between 1.5 and two degrees, it's really vital to how, how significant those impacts are going to be um, on all sorts of things that affect food security and health and, and all the things that we um, take for granted as, as important parts of, of how we live. And bringing that more, more, more close to home, John mentioned you know, that the heat wave that we've had um, across much of, of the UK over the last week, um, we can see that the level of global warming, so that the figure shown at the bottom right, just shows you one measure of how many of those kinds of heat waves using the current Met Office heat wave definition, how many of them will, will happen in a typical year depending on the level of warming. So as we go between 1.5 to even higher degrees of warming, these events will become more and more commonplace. Um, and so this is vital for how our schools operate um, as we think about the future. Um, so I just wanna finish by saying, obviously I, you know, I, I, I have a vested interest here, I suppose, but I think climate and sustainability are really central to school governance. They underpin so much of what we're trying to achieve anyway. Uh, in terms of improving the life chances for the young people who are who are in our care. And this is a really big transformation that, that we're talking about. The young people that you're working for, they'll feel the impacts, they'll have the careers and the lives which are shaped by this transformation, shaped by the changes in extreme weather and, and climate impacts. Um, but I want to finish by, by hopefully saying that, you know, you, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be daunted by this. It can be daunting, it's a big topic, 
no one can be across all of it, even if you work in this area as a professional. Um, but I want to really emphasize that there is lots of help out there available. Lots of organizations want to, to help you to develop, help your schools develop. So please, please do ask for that help uh, and engage with us um, as we move forward. And I will stop there. Thank you so much, um, Andrew. And absolutely, Andrew's slides will be sent out in one one big long line with 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 the others um, as well. And if if I can just um, reiterate the the point about resources, uh, Megan will keep updating our campaign page to add other resources that that are available. And I know a number of people have asked about the cost the cost of various um, things. And we always do keep an eye on that when it's NGA, we're not in the business of, of you know, we can't quality um, assure things that, that, that we're pointing you out often in this area, they're very expert things, but we particularly do look at costs. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll come back to what resources um, are freely available. That's a good segue, I think, to Alex and your work um, at um, Ashton. So um please do tell us um about that and um let's go zero the the floor is yours alex thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to be here today it is um brilliant to be speaking to so many of you so my name is alex green um i work for the climate solutions charity ashton and we run the let's go zero campaign with uh, lots of other amazing organizations supporting us as well the campaign uh, we started just over a year and a half ago, and it's to demonstrate and quantify the demand that's out there for schools to take action. We know that, that there was a big change in the way that school leaders were looking at sustainability and what they needed to do. So the campaign there is to quantify that and to give schools that ability to say, yes, we want to be leaders in this. And we've got nearly 1,500 schools, colleges and nurseries across the UK now signed up. So we really are seeing that demand that's growing and growing. And that, just to sort of follow up on what Andrew was saying about the age of children. So our campaign is to, to get schools to zero carbon by 2030, which sometimes it looks like this feels like a really long way away and sometimes it feels it's just around the corner. So those, those children that are there now buying their new year seven uniform or their new reception uniform, it's when they leave the school that they're just about to go into, that's, that's 2030. So it, it really is, it will we'll blink and we'll be there. So we really need to be taking action. Our climate is changing. We see it, we see it around us. We saw it in real life last week when it was really baking and things stopped working and the trains didn't work properly and all kinds of things like that. We see it in our schools um, and it's not just happening somewhere else. It's really happening around us in our schools. We know that there's a big issue with heat and flood and all kinds of things within our estate. So we need to be taking action now. And I guess, the good news is that um, schools and education aren't a problem sector. You're not the bad guys in all of this. You know, you, you do have an impact. You have, there is a considerable carbon impact of our education system, but you're not one of the big horrible guys. The reason why we work with schools is because you are such an opportunity. You're an opportunity to change our societies, to change the way we do everything. You, you influence everything we do. Our teachers, our school heads, our, our governors, you are the influencers. I know we all think it's people on Instagram, but actually it's you guys there day after day making that difference because for a young person in school, their school is their world and they are influenced by everything that they see and that they do within their schools. So it's such an opportunity that you have to be leaders and your schools to be leaders to really make that shift. And you can lead in this exciting change. And we see so much action going on in schools. We see such wonderful things going on and not because they're being, the schools are being made to do it, but because they want to. Our leaders are really, really pushing that in the schools and our young people, I mean, they were marching in the street, waving placards and shouting at us to get on with it. So we can see that that's made a difference. And we can see actually that there's going to be quite a bit of demand for action coming ahead. 
thanks to the, the, the great stuff in the strategy from DfE and the things are changing. We're stepping up our game and our expectations of what schools should be doing and can be doing. And it's really for our governors to lead how schools can be ahead of the game, not playing catch up and sort of behind it. So when you're looking at that strategy and you're reading the strategy and thinking what needs, what do I need to do? So being having a sustainability lead in your school is an absolute first step, get on with it. Find that person, find that leader, recognize actually what you'll find is there's probably somebody doing it already, but they're struggling without recognition. So find that person and really embrace that. And where you need your climate action plan, don't wait to 25 to do it, get on and do it now. And all of this helps our teachers out there who we know are brilliant. Our teachers and our head teachers are absolutely wonderful. And they're going to try and do this no matter what, but they'll struggle and they'll reinvent the wheel and they'll do it all themselves. So let's make it as easy as we possibly can and really embed it within our systems, within our schools, within the whole management of our schools and colleges and nurseries so that really it becomes part of everything that we do. And just to emphasize what, what some of the others were saying is that there's so much out there. There's so much help already. Use the help that's out there already. Don't go reinvent the wheel. We don't need any more wheels here. We just need people to do what already exists. And most of this isn't rocket science. Turning the heating down a bit is pretty easy. So there's a whole lot of things that we can just start doing straight away. Now, when I talk to schools about what they can do, I always recommend the Transform Our World Climate Action Planning tool that is a brilliant tool to get you started on what you can do. It's free and it's easy. Uh, use it. it. I will put the link in the chat. It's there for any, any school to use. So do get on and use that. And I also talk about three areas where you could make, it, make a difference. The action that you take, your voice and your money. And actually, I'm going to focus a little bit on the voice bit. So you as governors have a very strong voice. Use it, be demanding, ask for change within your school, expect better, learn about what's the difference between a ground source heat pump and an air source heat pump and a LED light and all those things, find out all about it. Question, have those discussions and lead, use your voice to be that voice for change. So if your school or the schools that you are working with are not already signed up to Let's Go Zero, get them signed up. Get them to be part of this movement for change and have their voice counted um, and i look forward to all the questions that are coming back so over to emma again thank you so much um uh, alex and actually i'll ask you the first before um while in fact fiona you can take down the slides and we'll have the the four of us the four of us there but alex there was one very particular one while you were talking that you might want to just start off with which was how does let's go zero and eco schools work work together tell us tell us tell us a bit about that because obviously i think imagine there'll be a lot of people here for whom you know they're familiar with eco schools and their schools may well have been part of that for really quite a, for quite a while Absolutely, they, they fit really well together and um, Eco Schools are one of the organisations that supports uh, Let's Go Zero. So Eco Schools is, a, is an accreditation. It's a way that you show what you've done. So it's about you take your action and then you get accredited and, it, and it's, it's your badge. It's to show what you've, what, the action that you've taken in your school. So really good. If you're doing stuff, get, a, get your green flag Eco Schools, do it. It's a really good way to get recognition actually for those individuals in your school that have been toiling away getting that stuff so definitely recommend eco schools let's go zero it's a campaign it's 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 a it's a numbers game we need to show the demand the ambition that's out there within schools to be able to help help people like jonathan use that knowledge and use that demand and be able to to put it put in place new strategies and policies and changes so they work together but they're quite different so eco schools is, a, is an accreditation it's a badge and uh let's go zero is about um showing your demand in a quantified campaign Lovely. Thank you very much. So I've been sort of scanning the questions that we've come in and they, they sort of bunch um, uh, bunch together. Um, so I don't know whether to to start with the with the hardest, because um, you may well have um, uh, seen there was very one really good to the point question that came in early on is if we want to make most impact, where do we start first? What should we be um, prioritizing? So I, I, I think that's a really tricky one, but but I can quite see why that was asked. So um, I don't know whether each of you wants to um, wants to have a go at that. Jonathan, should we, should we start with you first? 
Um, I was going to defer to Andrew on this as the expert, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will happily have a go, um, and then Andrew can correct me. Um, I, um, I I think the best place to start is um, having a conversation, and and uh, because uh, and that's what we did. Because when I, when I I I spoke to my line manager, said, "What are we doing about COP twenty six? And he said, "Well, why don't you put on a TED talk?" And I, the first thing I did is I go talk to a young person and see what they would want from the Department for Education uh, at COP26. And, and so I think the very first thing you should be having a conversation with, with your pupils, with your parents, um, with your other governors in your school uh, and saying, right, what, what do we want to do about this? Because we're going to have to do it together. It, it's not going to be, so we're absolutely supporting identifying a sustainability lead. But if you identify one sustainability lead, they will become isolated in a silo and everyone will think mm. it's their problem. Oh. Mr. Smith is sorting out sustainability and climate change for us. We don't have to worry about it now. Uh, it's got to be a full systems approach. So the very first thing I do is have a conversation, have a school meeting about it, have have um, have a board meeting about it, get it on the agenda. And that's what I did in, in the department. I, is the first thing I did. I, I got it onto the DFE board and said, "Where is this? Where is this in our risks? What is the operational risk to the education system from climate change sustainability?" And we didn't have it written down. Yeah, you've got you got flu. A vax, um, pandemic, flu pandemic, is there as a risk, an operational risk to the education system, but it wasn't there. And now we have it there in our published risks. It's up there, the risk of flood, overheating, um, etc. Thank you. Um, Andrew, do you want to add add to that? Yeah, I mean, I fully, I fully endorse that. I think I think having a conversation is is a really great place to start. I think um, what, what you will find is that the action you need to take as a school is very different depending on what you've already done. So um, as Alex said, and, and I'm sure she'll comment on, you know, there are many schools where people have been working away on this, that there are kind of shining lights in the darkness who've been doing brilliant work on this already. And they may have already done lots of the actions that you think immediately that, that you might need to take. So talk to them, find them, first of all, talk to your young people, and I think there will be brilliant examples of teaching. We, we've seen that already. We've talked to some schools where lots of great teaching has been embedded already, or, or it might not be in your school. It might be in a school across your town or city. It might be in another school in your, in your, in your trust. And so coming back to Alex's point about not reinventing the wheel, there is tons and tons of good practice out there. It's just about finding it. And, and that's, I think, what I mean by, by not being daunted you haven't got to start from a blank sheet of paper and invent this yourself. It's about picking what's already there and doing it um, and, and leading as a governor and saying, why, why are we not doing that? Why are we not taking that brilliant piece of training, which we know the school down the road has done? Um, and so I, I think that's, that's where you start. It's, it's conversations and it's also kind of assessing where you are. And that's the first point of any plan, right? For, you know, all of you who are professionals will know, you know, in your own organizations, you start by seeing where you are and then you plan on, on how to make it better. And that's, that's what you have to do here, I think. Thank you. And so Alex, apart from joining Let's Go Zero, what's, um, what's your, your starting point? I think the, the key thing is just start, get on with it, just do something. Um, it, there's very few things that you can do that will be wrong, but just get make a start. And actually by by making a start, by just having a switch off campaign with your lights or turning the heating down or doing uh, talking to uh, people about the food or anything like that, just makes a start. Mm. And actually all it takes is a few little successes that can really snowball into more and more and more action. So don't worry about what your footprint is or all the different details or but just just make a start. Um, and 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 you just use what's out there already, but definitely what Andrew said, find the pockets of excellence that are going on within your school or within your trust already. Teachers are the king or queen of their classroom. They'll be doing all kinds of things that aren't school policy, that aren't whatever, they'll just be getting on with it because it makes sense and they do it because they care. So find out what's going on already. Um, and that's, that's, but just, just get on with it, do something. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And in fact, our, the guidance has tried to at least start with some of that on, on some of the tips, some of the things you you can do. And we've mentioned a few of them already. And I think some of them have been in the in the chat as well. So I noticed somebody was talking about water saving, which is one of the ones we've picked up. Food that Alex has meant, uh, just mentioned is a really important one. Meat Free Mondays seem to be um, uh, working working well in lots of um, uh, lots of 
of, of places. So we may come back to some of the specific things that people have asked, um, but particularly, um, Jonathan, I, I know you need to, to leave a little bit before the end, so I don't think I can have you here and not ask the resources questions. You might have noticed that a couple a couple of the questions um, uh, did ask about resources. Um, in some cases, it may well have been revenue, but I did notice um, a couple that were around capital in terms of particularly around um, solar panels, um, for example, and um, air source um, uh, pumps, ground source uh, uh, pumps, which, and I don't know whether anyone, whether Alex, you're the person to ask, there were some very specific questions about solar panels and where to go and how how important are, are, are they? And actually on one or two of our case studies, um, trusts had actually um, uh, put solar panels in, in, in the case of Dartmoor Mass, I think about 10 years ago and really got a, has had a return on them. So we might be able to help with that as well. But things that need resourcing that are not currently available from the school budget jonathan uh so firstly em i can i can hold on till six i've uh oh I, brilliant I, I always had to get my daughter but my my wife has finished early so she's <laughs> she's gone to get her um <laughs> oh, <brilliant. laughs> the um so i think i'd, I'd start by saying that the, the the majority of funding that the government has put in place on emissions in the school sector is through the school rebuilding program um and the priority school rebuilding program and the free schools capital program so it's committed that all new builds from last november so from november 21 um new replacement blocks or improvements blocks will be net zero in operation um and we've also uplifted uh basic need by 12 percent. so local authorities when they deliver new blocks for new capacity will also deliver those to net zero that doesn't answer the question I, I fully admit about the retrofit or installation of solar panels um in the short term we don't have an answer right now but what we have done to try and unpick the answers we've sat down with alex at let's go zero was very helpful and convened some business leaders and some finances and we've also then brought in some uh business leaders to speak to the secretary of state and exploring how routes for financing for things like led replacement solar panels um for for school specifically for schools and we're exploring those ideas at the moment we don't have an answer yet but we're working with the likes of let's go zero and other organizations to, to to explore those ideas so in the short term the main access to funding would have to be through the uh through bays um um and and that department and they've got two schemes which schools can can apply into one is the uh public sector decarbonisation skills fund so that's where you can apply to get money to employ consultants or 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 to other people to actually assess things in your school and, and do the work to be able to put in later bids and then there's a public s sector decarbonisation fund which is actually where you get the money to then do those things um that that's that sort of back a 1.9 billion pound scheme that we were complying for and it, it opens shortly over the summer and we've been we recognize that the route into schools for that is not as easy as it should be so we've made two commitments in the strategy one is to uh try and align windows with with better with the school term so schools can apply in, in it to easier and the other way is um we are looking at how we can actually uh allocate or separate out a pot that's specifically for schools because that all the public sector can apply into that, hospitals um yeah. prisons etc um but for this year because we've kind of missed you know we, we're trying to get work really quickly with bays but they want to go ahead with their scheme already so this year what we've done is put on a series of webinars for school teachers and for governors to to to, to help them apply into those pots um and we have yeah i think i'll stop there i think in terms of that. thank you alex do you want to do you want to add to to that yeah so there's there's lots of options out there for um solar and uh there's a whole variation of them in terms of the way that uh, different organizations that will do it as well as different ways that you can pay for it you know more upfront more over time and it depends on your site who owns your building what how many what kind of reserves you have what level of risk you want and all kinds of things so you've got to make it like any other business decision you would make for your estate um couple that we we I've heard very good things about so solar for schools and Eden sustainability both very um sus Eden sustainable uh, um very good in terms of the guidance but shop about there's loads out there 
find out which other schools locally have used somebody. Is there a local contractor that will do it for you? And explore the different various options for financing. The feedback that we're getting is there's private financing out there. It just you just need to find out which one is better suited for you in the financial setup of your of your school or trust. So so explore it and speak to speak to other schools about what they've done and how they've done it. Thank you. Um, and I might now be rolling um, a couple of questions together, but I think that um, I, I think they're relevant, but people can pick me up in the comments if I'm misdirecting things. There have been a couple of people from smaller schools and from rural settings asking those questions. So this is a sort of double, a double handed question, really. And um, we we have been really aware, Megan and I, when we've been doing this work over the last six months, that it's actually the context you're in does make a difference. And quite often we've been, had urban schools really jealous of actually the land around rural schools or just their ability to, to get to wild wild places more, more, more easily. But I think that other point about size and working together, because the sort of thing you're talking about, a lot of small schools only have a very little bit of a school business manager. So there's a real issue there in, in terms of capacity. So, you know, as NGA, we're really encouraging people to do that through networks of school business managers. If you're not part of a bigger trust that can help help you um, uh, do that. But I just wondered whether um, any of you had sort of thoughts on that whole, you know, urban, urban, rural, what works differently? And somebody also then raised the question about actually, which I think is similar, is about localizing the global, that some of this stuff is at global level and how can we really make it work, work best locally? So Andrew, as I didn't give you a go last time, do you want to start, start this, this time on pick out, pick out from those list of issues? I, I mean, I, I mean, I definitely think that the, the collaboration is is really important here. So um, the, the collaboration in groups of small schools, which I'm sure that, that those schools have to do anyway to, to be able to address some of the other things that, that, that they need to do um, is, is really vital here. It comes back to this idea of, um, you know, this is a this is a global problem that we have to address with global solutions. And so we, we need to work together to do that. There are organizations, you know, Let's Go Zero, for example, is a great organization which can help to um, connect schools together and has examples of best practice, which other schools in, in local areas can, can draw from. I think the, the, the challenge is that, you know, both urban and rural schools face, face huge challenges here, right? In that, um, you know, that there are dimensions of this problem which are specific to urban areas around air pollution and uh, overheating risk being larger um, and, and those kinds of things. Um, there, are, there are other challenges for, for rural schools uh, in terms of, of flooding or in terms of um, the, the, the needs to have emergency power and all, all these kinds of things. And so I think just by, by working together is really the only, the only way forward here. Um, and you know, to kind of draw back to the, the climate ambassador's point, you know, if you've got a group of schools together, you know, the ambassador doesn't have to visit you in person, right? They can they can do lots of this online as, as we're doing now. So um, take all those opportunities that are there, I think, is, is my only piece of advice, really. Thank you. And Jonathan, I think I saw you putting your hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Emma. I just want to talk a little bit about the National Education Nature Park, because we feel like this will be a useful tool in helping link sites. So I spoke at the start about we want every site to be considered as, as one virtual national nature park and we, we hope that 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 concept will, will demonstrate physic on, on the on the inf interface how you can get to other sites or link up between sites how you can access national forests or other locations so if you're in a really dense urban area to show you how actually there is probably quite a lot of green quite close to you and how you can get to it and how you link to it um we want that that national education nature park to also share best practice so i think emma you spoke about the, the plethora of resource that is out there one of the things we set in the strategy is to try and we want to set up an accrediting body to say this resource is right. This is the things you should be trusting and use the nature park to be the conduit to get to that material. So it's easier for business leaders, governors and, and, and school teachers to choose the right material um, given their time is so limited. Um, and as part of that um, nature park, we are exploring um, 
how we can have a particular funds that can can look at different areas so we're hoping there'll be something around targeting particularly difficult urban areas through the nature park and how they can start on their biodiversity journey and um, and, and please say that reading university are one of them in our champion areas but we're working with um 11 now universities as champion areas who would want to work with their with schools around them um and then uh, reading is, is very fortunate that it has is a large amount of grounds but we've got some city center universities are also showing how they are greening and wilding and um bringing in other other schools around those places thank you alex did you want to add to that yeah just to come in really i mean yes we all know that it's it's not fair you know some schools have different different uh, opportunities than others and different sites and access to nature and all that so so sort of we have to sort of go past that but couple of points where where there are opportunities for help so make sure that you are really making the most of them so your local authority again it's one of those ones where it's not really fair some of the local authorities are wonderful they have such great champions most of them are getting better actually so even if you tried six months ago or a year ago to engage with your local authority try again um Church of England, if you're Church of England schools, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on with Catholic schools as well. So do sort of get, speak to the, your faith um, organisations if you can, if you're part of that. Um, and then, yeah, just to, just to emphasise what Jonathan was saying about the, the stuff that's going on at DfE, so the Education Nature Park and the Climate Leaders Award and all that stuff that's coming up. There's some lovely things on the horizon. Keep your eyes open, be part of it. Don't wait and wait and wait and be the last one on the list. Get a volunteer to be the pilot school and the test case and the this and that. You know, be 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 one of the leaders that can really um, do some, some exciting stuff. And then also just just find out what your other schools locally are doing. What you know, Google it, see what schools are look in the press, find the examples, um, ask people. This isn't rocket science. There's so much stuff that you can do that you can get started and doing. Um, so just yeah, find find out who else is doing stuff. Thank you, Alex. And that was something else I noticed in the chat that a couple of people um, mentioned work that was going on. I think Oxfordshire has, um, has uh, you've been doing a, a lot there for some time, but also Sheffield Learn. I, I, I noticed you've got things in going on in South Yorkshire, which I have to admit, I don't think, Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, we've particularly um, included regional and local things in our resources. Um, I was sort of, yes, hoping there might be somewhere else to go, but it will be something maybe that we take away from this um uh discussion because um and uh, jonathan in terms of that accreditation that that will be done in the future i think that will be really really helpful there was another comment in the in the thread that i would have asked you um if you hadn't mentioned it which was how do we know what's good i think carol you you said in the questions we're getting an awful lot of stuff from people and we don't know which is the stuff we ought to follow up on so i think that that is really helpful that's the other side of the coin isn't it from the fact there are so many organizations in this space at the moment when schools really need to prioritize their time it's quite difficult to know which which is the ones to 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 start with or continue um uh with which perhaps relates also to the um uh questions around um leadership and we talked you've mentioned it already uh, jonathan in fact i think probably you all have in terms of leadership um capacity and we've obviously been quite keen on the idea that one should have you know at least two leads because the the campus stuff is very technical and very specific in terms of the school business manager or the trust um chief operating officer and then a lot of the educational and community things perhaps um uh, lie somewhere somewhere else and we don't i think it was you andrew that said you know we don't really want this to be siloed in one body um who then oh it's fine they're doing it and similarly i noticed there was a question about should we have a link governor or a link trustee again some of our case study schools or trusts have done that and that's always the thing you need to with any link governor ensure that it doesn't just become their um, baby but actually it's a whole board whole whole school um, uh, approach so perhaps I don't know whether it's worth just saying a little bit more um, Jonathan in terms of that uh, making the capacity for for leadership time in the first instance and then as Andrew said we then need to develop other members of staff but there was a very specific question about carbon literacy training and I know that's something you you have got plans on so do you want to, to, to say a few words about that uh yeah i'll start with the car the climate literacy bit um 
so there are lots of offers already out there for carbon literacy training um uh, but we will work with providers to kind of offer to the to make it clear to to schools and and to, to governors what is the right or what we what we'd endorse as climate literacy training um and we'll be doing that rolling up as part of our kind of toolkits and things coming out as part of the climate action plans so we're we're, we're getting to that place we're not quite there yet in terms of we've made the commitment to to, to provide that company's training to save leaders but we're not quite there yet in terms of announcing how we're going to quite do that or say yet so um uh, thank you for pushing me on that one emma but i can't can't quite say yet because we're still working that through with minutes exactly how that will work in the delivery model for it but we envision that it will we very much look into different areas and offer and shape these as all the providers and in some way so we can give a clear steer about the people to access in terms of capacity on leadership i mean we hope you know if you have a good knowledge and foundation that increases capacity often doesn't it in terms of how you do things um but we're very much of the view the climate action plans needs to be to be owned collectively and and then we shouldn't be thinking about the capacity of just the teacher or just the business leader um and you know the climate leaders award um that will be aimed at at, at the learners um we hope will mean that some projects will be taken on by young people to empower them to make the change themselves um, so when we think about that climate action plan and the capacity to implement what you set out in that climate action plan, it, it should be a whole a whole school approach. And when I think of a whole school, I mean the carer, the parent, the pupil, the governor, the, the leader, and the teacher. Um, I I think um, uh, yeah, it's probably. I think I'm not. I I think we recognise the capacity issue, and. <sighs> It's, I'm not, I'm not really more, more sure I can say on it, really. I don't know if Andrew or Alex, you have any other thoughts about capacity? I mean, this is the, this is the golden question, is it? How do you increase capacity? Um, uh, yeah. Indeed. Do either of you have have any thoughts on that? But I also noticed while we were talking, there's there's a question popped up, particularly around the curriculum, which we perhaps haven't spent quite so much talking about now. And I know is is a particular um, uh, issue that you've worked lots on and did mention some of the resources. So, um, Andrew, if you want to say a little bit more about um, the curriculum. Um, uh, to... Could I answer on the capacity bit and then pass yeah. quickly over to Andrew of course. curriculum? Because I'm not a curriculum person, so I'll pass <laughs> that def definitely over to Andrew. Um, so the, this is this is a very big challenge. This is a very big task. We have complicated estates. We've got many many buildings. This is this is going. This is you know um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. But it's not about saying right. Well, how am I going to do all of it? It's about how am I going to take the first step, the next step. And, and how am I going to make, make all the different changes? What's that roadmap that I'm going to have that starts with the first things? The, the phrase I use a lot is, if not now, when? And I don't mean that as in, oh, well, if you're not gonna do it now, when are you gonna do it? It means, okay, these are some things we can do, then we'll do them. And if the things that we can't do yet, we, when, when do we think we might be able to do them? So planning it out, planning it out long-term, and that's the best way to, to, to embrace this rather than looking at the enormous colossal task we have. Uh, and so okay. Alex's mm -hmm. view just prompted something else for me to think about. So one of the things, and Andrew might go into more detail on this, but so one of the things that the, the National Climate Action Group are doing is, as Andrew mentioned, the Climate Ambassadors. And we in the Department of Education are supporting that because that does add a, a technical capacity in some places to some of these schools and so they can call upon it. And, and we will continue to work with the Climate Ambassadors group to, to understand how we can scale that up and, and, and make that. So we feel that is a route for which we can add capacity. We're still working through the exact model how we do that at the moment with, with Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just want to build on, build on those things. I think um, that perhaps an interesting direction to, to go in terms of building capacity within school. I mean, I think the Climate Ambassadors, that is definitely our vision is to, is to bring that to bear on the problem and so, um, you know, I'm really, really keen to, to continue conversations with, with John on that. I think within school, um, for staff, it's about having things that recognise their, their role, right? So, you know, like, like all of us, um, teachers or other school staff are motivated by their own career development, recognition of that career development, and, like, and having skills which can then transfer to, to other roles. And, and you know, teachers and, and school staff move around amongst the education system, um, in the same way that, that all of us do. And so I think thinking about how that's recognized nationally is really important. So what is it that by doing this work, 
I can say as a as a professional, you know, I've I've contributed and used that for the next stage in my career. I think that's that's a key part of, of this development. I think to come on to the curriculum part, um, I think what's interesting about this problem, and I, and I apologize for kind of talking briefly about, about myself, but um, you know, these are such multifaceted problems that they involve learning for all of us. So, so as I say, I, you know, I work in a department which is a world leading climate science department. We started talking about what we do in terms of our food for events how do, how do we have the right food that's consistent with our the messages that we're talking about in terms of climate? How do we make sure that the milk in our fridge helps to contribute to, to this problem? And that is not easy for us to solve, right? So we had to do some learning. I had to do some learning to be able to make those kinds of decisions. And of course, that is going to be, be true of everyone. But that there is there is a joy in that learning and there is an upskilling in that learning so i feel more comfortable having that conversation with people than than i did five years ago when we when we started thinking about that and i think for young people this is such a brilliant opportunity so it's not just formal curriculum although we want um, some of this content in formal curriculum that that model that, that john talked about which is problem led which is young people being involved involved in some of this learning the skills about whether it's an air source or, or ground source heat pump, which is the right thing for their school, um, is it, is so so great for them, and it, it speaks so much to the development of skills and the jobs that we don't imagine yet that those the, those young people will need. A really interesting opportunity, I think, is through things in the secondary sector for things like the EPQs. So I had an interesting conversation with colleagues at Pearson um, last week, thinking about well. Our EPQs are a model for how we can get some of this um, into, you know, into, into more schools and into more young people's lives, um, linking to the Climate Leaders Award. Um, and so I think I think the co-ownership is so, so, so important there because it doesn't, it means that it's not siloed. It doesn't um, have this problem where if you have the great person in the school who leaves, they take all of the great work that you've done with them. It absolutely has to be a whole school approach. It has to be owned by everyone, has to be part of everything you do. And, and this is where the governor is so important because they're the person who helps to set those whole school mm. thinking approaches. Sorry to talk for a long time, but yeah. That's, no, that's, um, uh, that's great. And I think there are so many, I think as you said earlier, there are so many things that cross over the, the four of uh, the four C's and I have to say that I've learned huge amounts over the last six months and I still think I'm only beginning on on a, a lot of this and that's why I think you know upskilling the staff in particular who will be going to do this they have to go through that same sort of confidence um, building and, and and understanding the um, uh, yeah the scope and what is reasonable and what 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 isn't to do and I did notice a couple of people have um, uh, mentioned primary um, curriculum and I think we've got a couple of links from our camp page to various um, uh, things such as the UN um, uh, uh, resources but I'm sure there are others and again one of the um, uh, one of the schools that is is one of our case studies was, was a primary school led by and it often is started by somebody who's passionate about this who devised various ways of bringing um, project learning into primary um, uh, primary schools so some of this is people sort of in front of the curve isn't it and we're probably at the point now where what we're trying to do is mainstream this that it doesn't rely on a passionate person on the board or a passionate person in leadership or sometimes actually it's been a teacher a geography teacher science teacher a, uh, a primary teacher who's taken it on and grown um, with uh, uh, with the, the the topic. There's a couple of questions, I suppose, given this is a governance seminar. It's not surprising, which really come back to um, accountability. I, I suppose uh, a few people saying, "Oh, where is Ofsted in this?" Um, and the answer is, I don't think Ofsted's anywhere in this. But perhaps that's uh, the wrong way to 
to put it, but it's also quite contentious. We've debated it at some of our forums and we know only a minority of leaders and governors actually want Ofsted to be the, the um, sort of driver on, on this, but it might be that someone on the panel wants to talk about it. But there was also another question about um, monitoring. I now forget the exact word that, that, that we use, but obviously as the board, if we're gonna say, let's put some resources into this, how do we know that we are getting, you know, the right, the right amount of um, bang for our buck or just you know moving in 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 the right direction and um, there are an awful lot of people I think which that 2020 results showed who've done you know bits whether it's eco schools or you know recycling projects or this that or the or, or the other and it's how can we take that to the next level if we're going to invest how, how do we measure it and I know this is a really hard question that I wouldn't be able to answer if I was I was on the panel but every governing board is going to be thinking about this right we've put it into our strategy now we need to know what it is we're going to be looking at to see whether we're making any any progress so i'm conscious of the clock and um, it's only five minutes um uh left but if you can um maybe do two things at once both sort of leave everybody with a final message but if you've got any wisdom on um uh, monitoring um impact then it would be it would be really helpful to to share that um I don't quite know who, who thing that's so hard. Does anyone want to wave at me okay. to start? Oh, well done, Jonathan. Uh, sorry, Andrew, I think I just passed his hand <laughs> first. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'd say two things about monitoring. I think that there will, it, as a society, if we're gonna move towards net zero, there will be, I, and this is my personal opinion now, there will be legislation I imagine that will come in to mandate reporting of emissions and, and in Scotland you'll really see that it's mandatory for public sector so education settings to report emissions uh, so what we are doing in the Department for Education ahead of that that trend is we are working out a standardized way to help how education centers can report emissions scope one scope two and scope three we've started with the university sector we've got a project a pilot project with them at the moment and we'll get and then we'll think about how we do that in schools and colleges so i think one way of monitoring there'll be a, a longer term monitoring emissions but i think that's really scary about monitoring emissions and people will then get a lot get lost in that rather than taking action so i guess the thing i would think about is when we think about putting our climate action place playing plans together is thinking what action-based monitoring you can do so we are going to do this less, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do this. We're going to we're going to explore sustainable urban drainage. So we 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 funded in the department, I think, forty five schemes for sustainable urban drainage. We're going to actually think how many loos are leaking in the, in the school because you replace if you fix one leaking loo, you save one thousand six hundred pounds in in water costs every year. Um, so I'd be looking at action based monitoring. So what actions do we say we're going to do, and have we actually done them? And then my final message would be, we we are going on our journey as a department. We put a strategy out. It's not a final document. It's it's going to be a living document that we're going to come back to each year and see how we're out against it and see how we're doing. And we want to continue working with with groups like this. Um, I would say the one message: take the strategy as a green light to to go and do this now. Um, and that's what I would say. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything John said there. Pretty much, I um, just on the on the Ofsted point. Um, so, so I've had three Ofsted inspections in the time that I've been chair of governors, um, and they were all very different. Um, one thing I would say though is this is an opportunity to lead. This is a big global issue that we all need to address that our young people are crying out for us to address. That's what Alex said, right? Who were the people on the streets of the placards? It wasn't us, it was young people. They are the ones that want this. If you can show that you are a school who is addressing this in a meaningful, positive, action-based way, I just cannot believe that Ofsted wouldn't want to give you the biggest, shiniest tick that they possibly could, because this is absolutely what being a governor, what education is about, right? This is this is why we're doing it. So um, why you sit in that resources meeting at nine o'clock staring through another spreadsheet, this is it. So take it as an opportunity to lead and sing about it and make it the focus of what your school is doing and all the rewards and accountability will, will follow from that, I think. 
great thank you very much that's a very optimistic message and optimism is one of our um uh, framework for ethical leadership so we like a bit of optimism here so yeah thank 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 you for that i mean we haven't mentioned have we here sort of climate anxiety it, it hasn't come into the conversation but it's really important that we counter counter that so alex um your your final words i don't think i can compete with jonathan's leaky loo stat or andrew's call to action there but just to say don't wait until you have to do it i think is the message don't wait until offset are coming at you with a big stick um actually you know just do it be the leaders be be ahead of it and and don't worry too much about the details and the numbers as well i know yes we're going to need to be reporting and yes it is important to understand our exact impact we're all so far off zero we don't need to worry yet about the the, the exact numbers we just got to start and take action and be involved and be leaders and 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 that's how we really will um change our society for, for the better so that's all for me Thank you so much. Thank you so much for 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 your inputs, Alex, Andrew, and um, Jonathan. I'm sorry to the audience that I wasn't able to um, bring uh, bring your voices in, but I hope through the chat um, some of that has been heard and shared. We absolutely will share all the resources that have been referred to afterwards um, with you, as well as the uh, recording and the slides. Um, and I think that's we still see that as you know one of our jobs over the next few months is to keep compiling what resources are there will be ever so pleased when somebody is actually quality um, assuring them um, later on but also how some of these agendas go together we haven't necessarily talked about sort of you know energy saving at the moment it's one of the big issues that um, governing boards are talking to us about our costs so some of this stuff actually moves us in a good a, a good direction in terms of, of cost savings and um, one of the other pieces of work we're working on which has a link is that um, Steve Evans leads our work on um, financial efficiencies and resourcing and we're tying up these agendas there with his new guidance on procurement we'll will have an environmental sustainability element in so we're hoping to be smarter on that in the way that you all with your whole school approaches and whole trust um, approaches uh, will be so yes thank you for what you're doing and I think the message that came over loud and clear clear um, was that you know everything that you're doing that is in the right um, direction uh, will be will be um, a help and there are lots and lots of resources and indeed experts um, on hand um, so please do keep in touch again I think the very last slide has Megan's email address on it and we will um, absolutely be following up the um, issues that you've been raising today they will that they they will not get lost so thank you again to Jonathan Andrew and Alex and to you all for attending on this well what is a lovely sunny afternoon in Warwickshire um, thank you uh, very much and I'm sure you'll be hearing from us again um, on this topic goodbye <laughs>